welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. It has become very common in today's comic book marketplace for variant covers to be offered to readers. We're talking about pretty much every publisher out there making a variation of their comic where it's the same interior, but a different cover produced usually in lower numbers than the regular cover. And that's an incentive for both retailers and collectors to hunt down something a bit more rare. It's become very popular. But what's interesting is when you look at the entire history of comics, honestly, variants, pretty rare. Until the 1990s. That's when speculators got into comic books. They decided that they could invest in comics, flip them quickly for a little bit of cash, and variants started to become very popular, as well as their descendants, the gimmick cover. So today, we're going to look at the history of variant and gimmick covers. We're going to look at some of the best and the worst that publishers had to offer and try to answer the question, what did we get out of this? Was it worth doing? You know, did the publishers actually gain something from this? Is this something that people wanted? We're going to have a lot of fun. But before we get into it, a quick word from this episode's sponsor. Today, I'm talking to you about variant covers in comics, but thinking of all that variety makes me think of today's sponsor. Magic Spoon. There is a lot of variety when it comes to the flavors that this breakfast cereal can offer you. We've got fruity, we have blueberry, cinnamon, my personal favorite these days, maple waffle, cookies and cream, peanut butter, cocoa, and frosted. That's a lot of options, folks. And on top of that, on the back of each box, there are activities. This makes me feel nostalgic for the cereal that I grew up with. But the best thing about Magic Spoon is it doesn't just taste good, it's also pretty good for you. These days, I'm taking my health pretty seriously. And Magic Spoon is a grain-free cereal that makes it pretty easy to do that. It also has zero grams of sugar, four grams net carbs, and 13 grams of protein per serving. If you act now, you can use my code COMICTROPES to get $5 off your own personalized Magic Spoon variety pack. There's a link in the description below, or you can visit magicspoon.com and use the code COMICTROPES at checkout. The first variants worth mentioning were very, very subtle. In the spring of 1976, Marvel Comics decided to test whether raising the cover price from 25 cents to 30 cents would impact their readership. So, for several months, all of their titles, except Kazar number 16 and Inhumans number 5, were printed with both prices. Almost the entire country got the old 25 cent versions, but six regions tested the 30 cent cover price. Albuquerque, New Mexico, Boston, Massachusetts, Baltimore, Maryland, Grand Rapids, Michigan, San Antonio, Texas, and San Jose, California. Literally, the only difference is the advertised price on the cover. Some of these prices are in boxes, some are circles, some are starbursts, but because so few of the 30 cent variants exist relative to the normal price version, some collectors do enjoy hunting down these 186 cover variants. Similarly, the following year, Marvel again tested raising cover prices another 5 cents. This time, nothing about the design was changed just some for 30 cents and others for 35 cents. These are even more tough to find because they tested that in only four markets, Memphis, Toledo, Tuscaloosa, and Wilmington. There are recorded sales for Star Wars number one going for over $30,000. Of course, a big part of that is that it's a Star Wars piece of memorabilia. Another series of variants worth mentioning at this time frame were the versions of comics that were sold to the newsstand versus the version of comics that were sold to the direct market. Now, I've made an entire episode about the history of the direct market. I recommend you watch that. For the purposes of this video, the short version is that the newsstand editions would have a UPC code. Those were comics sold to grocery stores, convenience stores, places like that. And then there would be a version without a UPC code, and that was sold directly to comic book stores. That was the direct market. The difference is the direct market could order for wholesale prices. They could get the comics a little bit cheaper, but the newsstand could 
return copies that weren't sold. So they had to find a way to differentiate the UPC versus non-UPC. That, that idea was in place so that unscrupulous retailers weren't ordering at wholesale prices and then returning the copies that they didn't sell. In 1977, DC Comics used a single distributor for their newsstand comics that you could find at convenience stores and grocery stores, and that was called Whitman. They were also known for printing a lot of gold key comics at one point. You can easily identify these variants because the Whitman logo would be printed on the covers instead of the DC Comics logo. They also released lots of three-pack comics for 99 cents, a popular way to introduce new readers to comics. Marvel used several distributors for their comics, so they have a bunch of variations for their newsstand releases. Instead of a square for the price, they would use a diamond. Some of these had a UPC code, some did not, and some had a UPC code with a line through it. For decades, the difference between a variant for a newsstand version versus a variant for a direct market version wasn't really something that interested collectors, but in more recent years, that has become popular because technically there are less copies printed for certain variants. Now, at the time, it wasn't that popular because the accepted pricing model was using the Overstreet price guide. That was published once a year, and they didn't list comics until they had been out for a full year. By that point in time, any interest by collectors in speculating on a variant really had dulled because that book that they're listing has already been out for a year. So they didn't really know about it, they didn't really focus on it. But by the time Wizard uh, Magazine started pricing comics, and then of course when the internet could give you up to the day, up to the minute pricing and list all sorts of variants, now collectors have a lot more information at their fingertips, and some people do like to hunt down those variants. In 1986, a comic book variant was created specifically to engage interest with collectors. Man of Steel No. 1 was a reboot of Superman by John Byrne, following DC's event Crisis on Infinite Earths. Byrne illustrated two covers, one for the newsstand edition and one for the direct market. There's no articles about this working very well and DC did not continue to do this for a long time, so it's unlikely to have sparked much interest back in 86. However, DC did create two more variant covers the following year. In 1987, DC did a small market test of changing their name to Superman Comics. Justice League No. 3 was given a variant cover with a Superman Comics logo that had completely different cover art, than the standard newsstand and direct market editions. This was only distributed to one market in Southern California, and DC also tried this in even more limited quantities with Fury of Firestorm number 61. Because of the low print runs, these variants are also sought after by a contingent of collectors. That said, neither Justice League nor Firestorm were created with the intention of grabbing the interest of the casual reader with a gimmick. These were variants produced as a marketing test. Also in 1987, Marvel produced one variant cover. Amazing Spider-Man Annual No. 21 featured the wedding of Peter Parker and Mary Jane. The newsstand edition featured Spider-Man on the cover with his enemies behind him. The direct market version was Peter Parker and his supporting cast. These versions don't go for wildly different prices like the Justice League and Firestorm issues, but that's probably because the wedding was a big event and many issues were published, so they aren't as comparatively rare. So far we've discussed how early variants were really only created to test marketing ideas, to test pricing initiatives kind of mundane, boring stuff. But right at the tail end of the 80s and blowing up in the 90s, variants became huge as they were designed to be an incentive to grab readers. Folks, let's get into the good stuff. The first variant cover that was also a gimmick did not come from Marvel or DC, but rather an independent publisher, New England Comics. In September of 1988, they published issue two of Ben Edlund's superhero satire book, 
the Tick, with a die cut in the center of the cover which showed the titular hero from the first splash page. About 200 copies were printed without the die cut, but they were not sold in stores. Second printings did not feature the die cut. The die cut doesn't necessarily add anything to the story, but it was a unique looking book, and when you aren't one of the big two publishers, you need to stand out. The next gimmick came out the following year from DC Comics, and was fairly tame by today's standards. In 1989, the Batman movie was coming out, and Bat merchandise was unavoidable no matter where you were. The hype on it was insane. DC decided to launch a third Batman title. It had been 49 years since a new ongoing Batman title was launched, and DC wondered whether there would be an audience for that much Batman. Which is kind of funny from today's perspective when you can see up to 20 Batman related titles on the shelves in a given month, but it was a more innocent time. Ultimately, the orders for Legends of the Dark Knight number one were huge. We don't have hard numbers, but it was over 200,000 copies, and it was definitely the most printed issue for all of 1989. DC was surprised by the high orders. In fact, they were nervous that retailers had over-ordered and would try returning a lot of copies, so a last-minute decision was made to include a wraparound cover to add value. The run was divided up into equal quarters with different color wraparounds, blue, yellow, magenta, and orange. Additionally, marketing head Bruce Bristow was uncomfortable that the first issue's cover did not feature Batman, so the wraparound evoked Batman more strongly. The fallout of this decision helped lead to the popularity of gimmick covers. Retailers didn't expect to get four different covers, and many readers and collectors opted to buy all four. The book sold very well, and the industry noted that. About a year later, Marvel was ready to launch a fourth ongoing Spider-Man title, and also decided to create variant covers to build on the excitement. The book already had something going for it. It was going to be written and illustrated by superstar Todd McFarlane. Marvel released the iconic cover in a regular version, but also versions with silver foil or polybagged. All of them cost the same, $1.75. A second print run went with gold foil. They sold very, very well. Including all the variants, there were over 2.5 million copies produced. An insane number today and also back then. So far, each of these issues were the sole gimmick for each year. But the sales on Spider-Man encouraged Marvel to do a lot more gimmicks moving forward. In the spring of 1991, issue 50 of Silver Surfer was released. Writer Jim Starlin and artist Ron Lim had been building up a storyline with cosmic villain Thanos, and issue 50 celebrated this with a cover that was both covered in foil and embossed. This is the first time I can find an example of an embossed cover being made for comics. That summer, Marvel released another huge first issue. X-Force number one was a rebooted version of The New Mutants, headlined by hot artist Rob Liefeld. The issue came polybagged with a random trading card. This time, Marvel printed about 5 million copies, a new record less than six months after Spider-Man. And Marvel wasn't done yet. Just two months later, they released X-Men number one with art by Jim Lee, who was arguably the most popular artist in the comics world at the time. This time, Marvel took a page from DC from when DC had released variants for Legends of the Dark Knight. There were five versions of X-Men number one produced. Four of them contained images that could be combined to form a type of poster. These were sold for $1.50 each. Then there was a fifth version that had a double gatefold cover that could fold out and show the image all at once. This edition had no ads and was sold for $3.95. Combined, the five versions accounted for sales of over 8 million copies, still the record for most copies of a single comic produced, and unlikely to be unseated anytime soon. When you look at how many millions of copies of Spider-Man, X-Force, and X-Men were sold, it becomes very easy to understand why Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, and some of their fellow creators left Marvel to create Image Comics. They could write their own ticket. Yeah, Spider-Man and the X-Men were popular, 
But I think in this instance, it's very provable that the creators were the real draw. And Marvel either couldn't or wouldn't compensate these creators for what they believed and could honestly prove they were worth. So they left. That was a big deal. Nevertheless, I think we can look back and say 1991 was truly the year where the gimmick cover was born. They would prove to get weirder and more popular throughout the 90s. Wedged between the blockbuster releases of X-Force and X-Men was issue 15 of Ghost Rider. This issue had a new gimmick, Glow in the Dark. I would argue it was perfectly suited for the character, and the artwork by Mark Teixeira looks fantastic even without the glowing skull. But the glow is certainly a nice bonus. What's unique about this is that issue 15 was not a first issue or an anniversary issue. This was just a gimmick cover for the sake of having a gimmick cover. Normally, the issues were priced at $1.50. The Glow in the Dark cover went for $1.75. And it must have worked well, because Marvel quickly issued a reprint with the Glow in the Dark cover. This issue showed to Marvel that a non-anniversary issue could feature a higher-priced gimmick cover, and it would sell. So, why were the issues selling so well? Did readers truly crave all these variants and gimmicks? Not necessarily. I know as a kid, I did love these gimmicks, I'm not gonna lie. But you have to look at the landscape at the time. Sports cards had very recently become a massively popular commodity for buying and trading for reasons of their own. But what's important to note is that this led to non-fans getting interested in the hobby as speculators, looking to buy and quickly flip cards for a profit. They soon looked to comics as a related hobby that they could do the same thing with. Add to this that Marvel Comics had gone public in July of 1991. Leading up to that, and especially once Marvel became a publicly traded company, Marvel was now extremely motivated to prove to their shareholders that their profits were going up every single quarter. A simple way to do that was to play into the speculator demand and to produce these gimmick covers, which to a casual reader looked like it was something special. The more of these gimmick covers they could create, the better they could do with short-term profits to boost that quarter's earnings. So that was the real reason why gimmicks became so prolific. It was all about short-term profits. Marvel far and away featured more gimmick covers than any other publisher. DC did more than dip their toe in the water though, with gimmicks like Eclipso No. 1 in the summer of 1992. That one featured a plastic purple gem affixed to the cover, representing Eclipso's powerful black diamond. It's worth noting that this gem is easy to get loose, and even if it doesn't, it will poke into whatever comic is stacked on top of it, so be careful with that issue. Another DC gimmick was the November 1992 issue of The Spectre, which featured a glow-in-the-dark cover. They used that gimmick again just a few months later for issue 8. At the same time, DC was releasing the third miniseries for Robin, and they featured a lenticular card on the cover. When you shifted the book left and right, the image seemed to move. That said, the execution was not flawless, and the cards look very dark and muddy most of the time. You could flip it over and you could have a totally different cover. It's not moving. It's just shifting colors. Still, Marvel released seemingly dozens of gimmicks to DC's handful. For instance, issue 50 of Wolverine's solo title featured a die-cut cover. Normally, the book was priced at $1.75, but it got a hefty markup to $2.50 for the die-cut cover. It was well executed, though, I will argue that. The cover features Wolverine's claw marks cutting through a file folder regarding his history thematically appropriate to the character, and relevant to the story within. Spider-Man's books became one of the biggest users of gimmick covers. For instance, in June of 1992, all four of Spider-Man's titles featured a hologram on the cover to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the release of his first appearance in Amazing Fantasy No. 15. But then, just seven months later, Marvel celebrated Spider-Man's 30th anniversary again with a foil cover on issue 375 of Amazing Spider-Man. 
That was to celebrate the 30th anniversary of issue one of Amazing Spider-Man specifically. The hologram and foil covers bumped the cover price up from $1.25 to a whopping $3.95. More pages were added, but that was still a very high cover price for the time. I went ahead and reached out to editor Danny Fingeroth. He was the editor of the Spider-Man titles at this point in time. I reached out to him on Twitter and asked, you know, were there any gimmick covers that you resisted? And uh, he kindly replied, saying it was an endless battle. If you think we produced a lot of gimmick covers, you should have seen how many we resisted. I don't doubt it. So it's just clear that it was the business side of Marvel that was pushing these as compared to the creators and editors. This is as good a time as any to mention that I do not consider this video to be a comprehensive list of every variant cover. Instead, I'm just talking us through the history. I would love to hear in the comments below what your favorite or least favorite cover was, but for now, we're talking about the variant and gimmick covers in 1992, which were very much still on the rise. In late 1992, Marvel launched a line of comics set in 2099, and each of these debuts featured some foil on the cover. It was shiny, it was selling. But Marvel was emboldened by the sales of books like Ghost Rider 15. Many issues of books that were only selling okay would feature a gimmick cover to boost sales. Sleepwalker issue 19 came with a cardboard mask that you could punch out and wear if your idea of fun was to walk around town with a comic book cover on your face, which also featured the main character's name printed across his forehead. Fantastic Four had several issues with hollow foil graphics for issues that were not anniversaries, like number 375, or embossed covers so that there was some depth to the cover, like issue 371. The Avengers were one of the worst offenders, with issues 363, 366, and 369 all featuring embossed foil covers. One of the biggest events in comics around this time was the death of Superman. Issue 75 of Superman from December of 1992 came in several variants, including one that was polybagged in a black bag. This included a fold-out poster, an obituary page from the Daily Planet, card, some stamps, and a black armband. The regular edition was $1.25, but the polybagged variants went for double. That issue got a lot of national attention, and the first prints sold 3 million copies, with reprints adding to that to get to a total of a staggering 6 million copies printed. It wasn't enough to beat X-Men number one, but it was close. The gimmick cover initiative bled over into independent titles. In January of 1993, Malibu printed issue 5 of The Protectors, with a die-cut bullet hole going straight through the entire issue. While it made for an interesting cover, it meant that the rest of the pages of the issue just had a hole awkwardly interrupting the artwork. They didn't even take full advantage of the hole because the final page, featuring Nightmask having been shot, doesn't even have the whole line up on his body. About the same time, indie humor book Jab used the bullet hole gimmick, but instead of a die cut, they literally had someone shoot the books. Jab issue three allowed you to order copies of the book shot through with 22 caliber, nine millimeter, 45 caliber, 357 Magnum, and a shotgun. The blog Progressive Ruin has scans of interior pages showing how some of these stories work the whole into the story. These variants were shot through in stacks of 10, and the first one would have powder burns on it, which technically makes it a variant of a variant. Another indie humor book with a cool gimmick was Sergio Aragone's superhero satire, The Mighty Magnor. That cover featured a pop-up. Pretty brilliant in my opinion. On the other hand, Image Comics published Blood Strike No. 1, which commanded you to rub the blood. The reason for that gross command was that the cover had heat-activated pigments, so when you rub the blood streaks on the cover, they would change color. That's probably a good way to damage the comic, but it's also a comic that there isn't a lot of demand for, so that's sort of a wash. Hey, Ryan.
It's dried blood. Throughout 1993, Marvel had a big crossover across their six X-Men titles. Each of these featured a three-dimensional hologram. Holograms are cool, but these were smaller than the ones on the Spider-Man covers and basically amounted to a trading card being glued to the cover. They aren't integrated into the cover design. It's just sort of an extra thing on top of the artwork. I like holograms, and little kid Chris did like those holograms on the X-Men books at the time. But I have to admit, looking back at them now, they're kind of blurry for holograms. They're not excellent. Uh, while there are still some interesting ideas for gimmicks still to come, I think it's also worth noting that 1992 was truly the peak for gimmick covers. After that, they're really only being added to boost the cover price. There's still a couple new ideas for gimmicks coming, but mostly at this point, it was just stuff like Marvel putting a hollow foil cover on anything they could get their hands on. Meanwhile, DC had the return of Superman in Adventures of Superman issue 500, which featured a white poly bag. However, this was a case of diminishing returns in my opinion. Unlike the black poly bag, there were no extras included, just the issue itself. The quality of gimmick ideas became very hit and miss by 1993. I'd call that a miss. Another miss is issue three of Neil Adams' book, Megalith, from August of 1993, which featured a Tyvek cover. Tyvek is a durable material, hard to tear or to destroy. So I get what they're going for with a book featuring a powerful superhero, but who wants to bother testing how badly they can attack a comic book? It's a fairly useless gimmick. An example of a hit was issue 321 of Daredevil. It wasn't an anniversary issue, but they gave it a glow-in-the-dark cover, which represented Daredevil's radar sense, which is notably absent for his demonic opponent standing beneath him. Another interesting idea was Batman issue 500, which featured the return of Bruce Wayne as Batman after Bane had beat him up. This was a classy die-cut and foil cover. Neither of the last two examples was new, but they featured good execution. In 1993, Chromium covers were king. Pretty much Valiant's entire line featured Chromium covers, and they do catch the eye. They shine and sparkle. Marvel used Chromium covers on issues of Spider-Man's Clone Saga and the X-Men's Age of Apocalypse events. They were pricey, but they certainly caught the eye. An example of something that didn't really catch the eye were three issues of the Midnight Suns crossovers through Night Stalkers, Ghost Rider, and Marvel Comics Presents in late 93 through the beginning of 94. They're almost entirely black. It stands out a little bit from the other titles on the racks, but it's hard to see what the book even is. As we leave 1993, we're slowly winding down on the age of gimmick covers. There were still a couple, though, that I want to mention that came out in 94 and 95. The first example is Marvels from January of 1994, a gorgeous book painted by Alex Ross. These featured an acetate overlay of the title over the art. It's nice to see the virgin artwork by Ross, but the acetate itself is pretty delicate, and it's hard to keep these in good shape. Acetate covers were also used on other comics, and not always for a special issue. Following that, in February of 1994, DC released Man of Steel number 30 with color forms. Those are basically plastic images that adhere to the treated cover so that you could create your own Superman vs. Lobo layout. Again, if you use it even once, I guess the cover is no longer mint, and the vinyl won't cling forever like a sticker would. But I have to admit, I think it looks fantastic. In May of 1994, Marvel released what I'd consider to be one of the worst gimmick covers with issue one of Forceworks. This was a spin-off from the Avengers, and the idea was that the cover could fold out into a bit of a three-dimensional poster, but it looks awkward, and generally, people can't easily fold it back together after it's been pulled out. And in early spring of 1995, Marvel released issue 400 of Amazing Spider-Man. 
This important anniversary issue featured the death of Aunt May, and while that was later retconned, it's a beautiful story in and of itself. Unfortunately, the cover was an embossed cover that was supposed to look like a gravestone, and there is just no definition to it, so it ends up looking like a muddy gray blob. This does not represent the end of gimmick covers in the 90s, but it represents the last of the new ideas. After this, Marvel, DC, Image, yeah, they all still published things with foil or embossed or chromium. That was all still used. It did start to drop off a bit, and some of that is because of what was happening at the time. In 1996, a lot of those short-term speculators vanished overnight. They lost interest in gimmicks, and simultaneously, Marvel fell into bankruptcy and cut way back on what they were doing. In general, there were a lot less gimmick covers over the next decade. There were still some, of course, but it wasn't something you could count on seeing every week on New Comic Book Day. But 10 years later, Marvel released Astonishing X-Men number 4 with an unannounced return of popular X-Man character Colossus, who had been killed off years ago. Marvel printed a 1 in 6 variant cover featuring Colossus that retailers sold out of quickly. Marvel realized there was interest in variants, if not gimmicks. So, at the end of 2004, Marvel was relaunching The Avengers. What they did for that book resonates today. They created a 1 in 20 variant cover for issue 1. As in, for every 20 copies of New Avengers that a store ordered, they could order one copy of the more rare variant. Marvel then produced a 1 in 19 variant for issue 2, a 1 in 18 variant for issue 3, and so on, until switching to a 1 in 10 variant for issues 7 through 10. When we analyze the sales data, and I find Comicron the most accurate source for that, you can see that stores ordered pretty steadily to get those variants once they realized that their customers liked them, which is a few issues into the run when they realized that. Orders went up for issue 5, and then the orders dropped off a bit after issue 10 the last of the variants. It shows interest in variants. Since then, variant issues for new titles has become the norm. DC produced blank covers, so-called sketch covers, for all of their new 52 line. And publishers from Boom to IDW to Image regularly employ variant covers now. In part, it's led to the rise of certain cover artists like Peach Momoko and Art Germ. I don't think variant or gimmick covers are inherently good or bad. I think it all depends on how well they're executed. What the danger is, is if you're creating gimmicks to court speculators, because that will always result in an artificial high. As in, at a certain point, people that are just buying to invest are going to leave, and that will lead to a sales slump. It happened in the 90s. We just want to make sure that something like that doesn't happen to the industry that we love again. That said, I think that if you've got a good idea that's well executed, it can absolutely add to the fun of a comic book. I think some of these covers are a lot of fun. You know, Silver Surfer with the embossed foil cover, that's cool. Ghost Rider, Glow in the Dark, that's cool. More recently, somebody like Jim Rugg producing a Blacklight comic. Again, that is cool stuff. I like these ideas. I like them a lot. So I would be very curious to hear from you. What were some of your favorite variant or gimmick covers? And what were some of your least favorite? I would love to hear that stuff in the comments below. Please consider hitting like and subscribe. And with, uh, with all that said, I think I'm done for this week. I'll see you again. Until then, Keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks. When you can look at the news. <laughs> 
Almost uh, got that right. Let's try that one more time. The popular pricing model at the time was the annual Overstreet Price Guide. That was published. Almost got it. To constantly show their shale and the X-Men's Age of Ex... Not Age of Extinction. Not Age of Extinction. Was that actually a crossover? Probably was at some point. 